So good to have each and every one of you here. As you know, we are going through the Bible together, reading every day together from the beginning to the end. One single story because the Bible, the Old Testament all the way to the end of Revelation, ultimately points to Jesus Christ. That's why we're calling it one single story story. If you have not begun the journey with us and you, you're like, here we are into early parts of February and that's too far for me to go back and catch up, that's perfectly okay. Start where you are today in the reading and go with us moving forward. We are doing daily podcasts. Many of you are watching those. I'm getting a lot of positive feedback from those. I encourage you to continue to do so. Share those with others. We have a dedicated website, onesinglestory.com, where you can go and get all of this information, including the daily readings and watch the podcast. And I have two or three, I think, of these journals left. It is all we have. We'll not be ordering anymore. If you're interested in one of the journals, they have the daily readings written out for you, place for you to record your thoughts and how the Lord may have spoken to you. If you're interested in one of those, see Julie Snow, who's in the very back corner. She'll be glad to help you with that, but you, you need to get those today. They will be gone. So last week, we looked at the story of Joseph and how he wound up in Egypt and the famine that took place. His brothers were forced to go down and buy grain and all the events that took place and how they, they came together, as it were. They were healed and reconciled and brought together by sharing food at a table. You remember? I thought the service last week was just absolutely amazing, at least to me. You know, once we got past the initial few moments where you were caught off guard and <laughs> resisted something different, most of you were absolutely converted by the end of that. And, and what I've been hearing this week is we should do this more often. And so I'm glad you had a good experience with that. But as we finished the message last week with the story of Joseph and him getting back together with his brothers and ultimately with his father, fast forward now, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 12 today. About 430 plus years of history have transpired since last week's message and today's message. The nation of Israel you know, moved down to Egypt because of the famine. They were put up in the land of Goshen, which was the best and the most fertile for them to have their flocks and the herds. And Pharaoh was very kind and gracious to Joseph and to his family. But what happened was that Pharaoh passed away. And the scripture says there arose another Pharaoh that did not know or care about Joseph and his family. How many of us understand that just because people are for you today doesn't mean they're going to be for you tomorrow? Amen. You ever experienced that? And so eventually they became slaves in Egypt and generation after generation, as I said, over 400 years transpired there. And so generation after generation, they're multiplying, but they have, they have no freedom, they have no liberties, they have no rights, they are slaves, they're taken advantage of. And that has been their history until we get to the book of Exodus. God speaks to a man by the name of Moses, tells him to go back and to lead the people out. And if you've been doing your readings, you've seen, we have seen nine of the ten plagues have already happened upon the land of Egypt. You with me? There's one yet to go, and that's where we pick the story up today. Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. It says, While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. He's about to bring about the tenth plague, which will be the death of the firstborn son in every household both Egyptian and Israelite, unless there is provision for their safety. And he's going to talk about that in just a moment. And he's going to finally bring about their deliverance and rescue. In fact, as we begin this passage today, at midnight on this day, God's going to miraculously work. He's going to bring about the tenth plague. The Israelites are going to be sent out rapidly out of the land of Egypt until unto what they considered their freedom, what they had longed for for so long. But I want you to notice in this first verse, it says that while the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions. Now, the instructions are going to be for what we call the Passover feast 
or celebration where they're going to kill an animal sacrifice, a lamb, and they're going to spread the blood and they're going to consume the animal. And he said this is to be for generations to come. In fact, it's still going on in the nation of Israel today. In the spring, they still observe Passover. And he said, I want you to remember what God has done for you in the future. But, but here's something I had never paid attention to before. God gave them the instructions for the celebration and for the worship before they ever saw the answer to the problem that they had been asking him for deliverance. It is good for us on the backside after God has moved on our behalf, after he has brought the, the answer that we've been praying for, what we have been seeking him for so long, it is wonderful to give him praise and worship after the fact. In fact, I would say that, and, and I'm putting myself in this with you, I would say that we usually do a very poor job of even that. In fact, I often say it this way. We should praise the Lord at least as long as we have asked for him to heal our situation or fix our problem to begin with. But here, while they are still in the land of Egypt, they are still slaves. They have still been taken advantage of. They are still beaten. They are having forced labor put upon them, as it were, while they are still in the land of Egypt, facing their dilemma. God gives them the instructions to worship and to celebrate him. Here's what I know by personal experience. When you have faith enough to begin to worship God in spite of your circumstances, the answer is just around the corner. If you've been praying and seeking God for a long time, you've been struggling with something in your life, your family, your circumstance, your situation, I'm not asking you to stop praying about it. I'm asking you to add thanksgiving and worship and celebration for the answer that you've not yet seen. And I promise you God will work miraculously. I'm reminded it was probably two, maybe even three years ago. It was at Thanksgiving and we were all seated around the table and our family tradition is that we all are at the table and after we have our meal, we go around one by one and give thanks for something specific that's very important to us, that has stood out to us recently in our lives and, and we go around and this particular occasion, my grandson, who at the time was either four or five, I don't remember exactly which one, but it came his turn and, and we said, okay, Greer, what are you thankful for, for? And first of all, first and foremost, I want you to understand, the first thing out of his mouth was, he said, I'm thankful for my Paje. That's me. That's me. Amen. Secondly, he said, I'm thankful for my four wheeler. The boy didn't have a four wheeler yet. He had mentioned wanting a four-wheeler to his father and his mother, and he had mentioned it to his Pa Jay. And in that room were both his daddy and his granddaddy that had not only the ability but the willingness to make happen what he was seeking after. And listen, when he began to give thanks for something he didn't even have, it made me and his daddy almost fight each other to see who was going to get the four-wheeler first. <laughs> but listen, that's exactly the spiritual principle that we're talking about here. Our Heavenly Father knows what you need and what you want and what you've been asking for. But when you have the audacity of faith to step out and say, I want to thank you for answering that prayer, even though I haven't seen the answer yet, he says, let me just go on and make sure it happens for them. Amen. So while they were still in the land of Egypt, he gave them the instructions. And this is what he said, verse 2. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. That's important. He's saying beginning right now, you're going to start measuring your time and tracking your calendar based on the miraculous work that I'm about to do for you rather than based on the experiences of your past. 
Some of us are still marking our calendars of time, as it were, based on the pain and the suffering and the loss of our past. Rather than saying this is a brand new day and God's going to do something special on my behalf and so now I'm going to look forward rather than look backward. At this point in history, Egypt had a 12-month solar calendar based on the sun and it was organized around the worship of their gods. They had 36 10-week Segments and each one was dedicated to a different God that they paid homage to during this time. And on this occasion, God implemented Israel's lunar or moon calendar, as it were, based on his miraculous works. And listen, here is a big, big shift and change for them. Rather than having a 10-day week, they are now going to have a 7-day week that will make provisions for a Sabbath day of rest. And listen, God hadn't even given that instruction to Moses yet because they're not out of Egypt, much less he's not on Mount Sinai with, for 40 days and nights to get the word from God. Are you with me? The point is so crystal clear here. God said, if you will start doing what I say to do when I say do it, and you start obeying me and worship me in the process, he said, things are going to change in your life so dramatically and rapidly. You're going to lie. I can't even believe this is taking place. So even their calendar and how they mark, the Egyptians' calendar started in the, in the fall. Theirs is going to start in the spring. And he says, from this point forward, you're going to look at the rest of your life differently because of my intervention on your behalf. Anybody need that kind of miracle in your life today? He's still the same God. Then he goes on to say, announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month... Each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice. Notice it's very intentional. He says you must choose, you must decide to participate in this event that's about to happen. If you want to avoid the death penalty, as it were, of the 10th plague, if you want you and your family rescued, protected and delivered, he said you've got to be very intentional about what I'm asking you to do and you have to make a decision to choose the lamb. Nobody comes to Jesus or in right relationship with God by accident. It is a conscious choice and decision on your part to recognize you are a sinner and you need a Savior. And his name is Jesus. He says one animal for each household. Notice somebody else couldn't do it for you. Not even Moses or Aaron that would be selected as the priest could do it for you on this occasion. It has to be a personal decision. He says one animal for each household. And if a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Do you see the principle of sharing the good news and the good story about salvation and redemption. You can't force it on your friends and your family and your neighbors, but we have a responsibility to make it available to them. He says, divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be, and he's about to give us four specific criteria that this sacrificial animal has to be. There's an age, a gender, a type, and a condition. Notice what he says. The animal you select must be a one-year-old. There's the age. Male. There's the gender. Either a sheep or goat. There's the type with no defects. All the way back to this point in the scripture, we see this principle, and it's repeated throughout the entire scripture, that God, one, expects a sacrifice on our part, our worship. True worship requires a sacrifice. In fact, I've said it many times, you really aren't worshiping if you aren't sacrificing. And it has to be very specific and very 
intentional and it has to be the very best that we have to offer him he said without any defects look at verse 6 he says take care or special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight between sunset and nighttime they are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frame of the houses can you give me that picture real quick it's hard for us to conceptualize and, and, and maybe you've heard the story, maybe you've read the story, maybe you understand fully, maybe you do not. But the picture for the Israelites, before the death angel is going to pass through at midnight, he said if you want to be spared, he said the sacrifice has to be killed, the blood has to be collected. And he told them to take some hyssop or some branches of this hyssop bush, he said, and put it on the doorpost both on the top and on the sides, they sang the songs this morning about the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This is where that comes from. This is the, the story behind the story, as it were. He said the entire nation of Israel, if you're going to participate, if you're going to be protected, he says the animal has to be slain. There has to be a sacrifice. Take some of the blood, smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses. He says where they eat the animal. This really gets interesting to me right here. I think we have a fairly good concept of being under or behind the protective covering of the blood of Jesus, as it were. But I'm not sure we understand the severity of the rest of the instructions that he gave the children of Israel are the same instructions that you and I need to follow. Not only did the sacrifice have to be made and the blood spilled and then applied on the doorframe, listen, that was an outward, external demonstration of their faith to others, particularly the death angel that would come through Egypt that night. He said, but it's insufficient for you just to have the appearance of my blood and Christianity on the outside. He said, you have to consume the lamb on the inside. I think far too long in, in the American church, we have been content with people raising their hand at the end of a service. If you say you want to know Jesus and raise your hand, and that's all that ever happens, or even come forward, or, or whatever the case may be, or, or to follow me in a prayer. Listen, I'm not saying those things are bad in and of themselves, but I'm telling you that the requirements are more than an external demonstration on the outside that people see. He said, you actually have to consume inside of you the lamb, the sacrifice. If you know anything about the Old Testament and Israel's history for the next 40 years, once they get delivered, they constantly moan and complain and sin against God and rebel. And God constantly was having to deal with them and bring judgment on them. Why? It's because they had the blood covering. They missed the death. But they weren't consuming the lamb on the inside. Listen, if you are struggling in areas of your life today that you can't get victory in, you've made a public profession of faith in the past. You've had, quote, the blood applied to the doorpost of your life, as it were. And it's an external reminder to others that the blood has been applied. But you are not consuming the lamb on the inside. Your life is not going to look much different. And you're going to struggle day after day after day to become more Christ-like. The saying, you are what you eat if you consume the Lamb of God through the written Word of God and through prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit, I promise you that you and I both will become more like Him. So they applied the blood to the outside, he says, of the house 
where they eat the animal. So we have a picture of both the external display and the actual internal partaking of the sacrifice. Verse 8. That same night they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens. That was to represent. Now listen, again, he's given the instructions for celebration and worship once they leave, but they are still there. But I love the fact that he says to them, I'm giving you specific instructions. The blood must be applied. You must consume it internally. He said, and to add to that, I want you to have bitter greens to eat because he wanted them every time, every year they observed this feast and festival. He said, I want you to remember the bitterness of your life before I rescued you from it. I really think it would be a great idea. For us to have something similar like this at least annually in, the ch- in this church where we have to go through a process including eating the bitter greens so that every time you taste it in your mouth, every time you try to swallow it, you remember what your life used to look like before Jesus delivered and rescued you. And I promise you it would cause us to be different people than who we are Today, if we would remember where we've been and what God's delivered us from. And so they were to eat the roasted sacrifice along with the bitter greens and with bread made without yeast. Unleavened bread. The primary reason he's given this instruction is for the feast that would take place in the future and for every year that would happen, including this year in the nation of Israel. He said, because when you leave Egypt, spend 430 years of captivity and many generations behind you have died there. But when you leave, you're going to leave so fast, he said, that you won't even have time to put yeast in the bread and let it rise and bake it. He said, because when you leave, you're going out of here rapidly. I wonder if there's anybody in this house today who said, you know what, I've sought God for a long time. I've prayed about a, about a financial issue. I've prayed about a physical issue. I've prayed about a relational issue. I've prayed about my family. I've prayed about my job. I've, I've prayed about everything that, that's on your personal list. And when God answers, I hope it comes so rapidly that I don't have time to look back or make any other preparations. All i got to do is move forward and be obedient to him. I wonder if there's anybody here with that sense of urgency. What my typical experience is to have a conversation with somebody about a circumstance or situation and rather than the anticipation, the expectancy of a miracle and deliverance and giving worship and praise and celebration for the answer that hasn't even come yet or having any expectation, typically a conversation will sound more like this. The, the, the problem, the issue will be laid out and, and then things like, I guess it's never going to change. I expect it's only going to get worse before it gets better. It's always been this way, so I guess it's always going to be this way. Do you understand life and death is in the power of our tongue, not just as it relates to relationships, but it has a great deal to do with how much faith is released in us so that God will step forward and do what he said he's going to do. He said, I want you to remember on occasions where you've come from and what I have already done for you. It is easy. And listen, I am right there with you. This has convicted me deeply this week. I need to be intentional every day and every week of my life of looking back and remembering at least something, one thing, the thing that God has done for me in the past, how he's miraculously delivered me so that my faith arises for in expectation of things that are yet in my future. And if you and I begin to do that, I promise you it will change the way we see things 
and our faith will end He goes on to give further instructions. He says, do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Now, how many of you want to go home today to a barbecue where there's a whole animal on there? Inside and out. I don't see anybody. Listen, this meal and its preparation and the remembrance that will take place on an annual basis moving forward was to be so unconventional because of the unconventional miracle of deliverance that God was going to do for them. Oh, Listen, if our worship just on a small scale, once in a while, reflected what God's already done for us in the past, our worship would be unconventional when we come in the house. Mm. Mm. I'm going to calm down. I feel this strong this morning. It's good, isn't it? He said, do not leave any of it until the next morning, but burn whatever is not eaten before morning. And here's an here's a extremely important point that I want to make before we move on. Listen, the instructions of God to you for your situation is always time sensitive. Hmm. I'm going to tell you, and I'm ashamed to say, I have missed God on more than one occasion, not because I was disobedient in the sense that I wasn't willing to do what he asked me to do, but I didn't move when he said move. The sacrifice and the provision that he's making for their rescue and deliverance is critical. It is time sensitive. He said in the morning it's going to be too late. How many times have you and I missed the answer to the very thing we've been seeking God for because we drug our feet or we analyzed away why now's not the right time to do what he tells us to do? And then we miss the opportunity and the timing of God and then we're poked our lips out and whining at God, why haven't you done what you said you were going to do for me? And he really wants to say, hardhead, I told you three times already. Amen. That's kind of the way it comes to me. <laughs> but do you understand, it is, it is not enough to hear the word of God or the voice of God or the leading of God. The timing of God is just as important. That's for somebody here today. He said, don't leave any of it till the next morning. Verse 11. These are your instructions for eating this meal. He said, be fully dressed. Now, I got to tell you, the first question comes to my mind, dude, they normally eat undressed. Um, And I'll go ahead and tell you, do not tell me after the service. <laughs> if you have any of those unique situations you observe at home when you eat, I'm just, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> but listen, what he means by this be fully dressed, he wasn't indicating or saying that they ate their meals undressed. not what he's saying at all. He said be fully dressed. It's like you're getting ready to walk out the door because if you're going to go out there today, you better have your cap if you want one. You better have your coat. You better have your long sleeves and your long pants on and your socks and shoes because it's cold out there. He's saying I want you to eat this meal prepared to walk out the door. See, the same door that had the blood applied and then they internalized the sacrifice, the lamb, is going to qualify them to walk out of the door into their future. Right. 
No blood on the outside, no internalizing the sacrifice on the inside means there's no qualification for you to move beyond where you are to your future. See, sometimes we have this narrow thinking that it's only about this circumstance right now and it's only about this current situation. And if God would just answer me here, no, the answer you're seeking from God when he speaks to you and the timing of it has everything to do not only with the moment or the thing you're seeking, but it has everything to do with your future and what it's going to look like. As you move forward. He said be fully dressed, ready to go, wear your sandals, meaning put on, we would say put on your shoes and carry your walking stick in your hand. He said eat the meal with urgency. Because something's getting ready to happen. Something's getting ready to change so dramatically and so swiftly and so significant. He said, you better be prepared to go when I say go. He says, for this is the Lord's Passover, verse 12, and on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. Are the Israelites living in the land of Egypt? Yes, they are, so they are included in this. Listen, just because they are, quote, God's chosen people as the Israelites, they are not going to escape this penalty of death unless the blood has been applied and the lamb and the sacrifice has been internalized. Because your grandma and great-grandma and granddaddy and your mom and daddy went to church and had a relationship. And listen, I'm not trying to be funny right now. Just because your ancestors had a relationship with Jesus is no guarantee that you do. It's a personal choice and decision. Amen. Because you were born and raised in a church and maybe you've never missed a Sunday of church in your lifetime, there's no guarantee you have to make a choice and decision to have the blood applied and to consume the lamb internally. He said, this is the Passover, and I'm going to strike down every firstborn son and every firstborn male in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment or punishment against all the, notice, little g, gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But, verse 13, the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you're staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Isn't it good to know as a believer that the blood is still a sign that the angel of death, not physical death, but spiritual death, separation from God, says that don't apply here because there's the sign. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Literally meaning you're going to escape the judgment, the punishment. The blood of Jesus is still necessary to escape eternal judgment and punishment. Are, are we in a faith-believing church? I said the blood of Jesus is still necessary. Just like there was one door coming into the house that had the blood over it, the blood still has to be applied. There's only one way to God, and that is through his son, Jesus, and his sacrifice. He says, I'll see the blood. I'll pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 14, this is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you, you ought to celebrate this. It'd be a good idea if you celebrated it. If you got nothing else going on, it's not what he said, is it? 
He gave it in the form of a command. He said, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. Here's one of my personal challenges for you this week. And I say, start working on it this afternoon before you forget it. You individually, if you're by yourself, you and your spouse, family members, sit down and start recording two, three, four, five, six, whatever, monumental events in your life that you know God showed up and delivered you and rescued you so that you could start looking back and remembering those things and giving him thanks for what he's done in the past and then look forward to what he's going to do for you in the future. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. And, and just if, you, if you're not, then don't. Don't lie here in church. How many of you are going to work on that starting today that you're going to go back and remember? I appreciate I appreciate it. Don't, no, don't raise them because I'm looking your way. <laughs> As I move my head, the hands go. <laughs> Each year from generation to generation, listen, there are stories and events in my past that I need to be intentional about sharing with my grown children. what God's done for me in the past some of the miracles he's worked on my behalf I need to tell those same stories to my grandchildren and you have stories that you need to be sharing with the people behind you that you have influence with he says you must celebrate it. This is a law for all time. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival remove any trace of yeast from your home. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. And on the first day of the festival and again on the seventh day all the people must observe an official day for holy assembly. He said every seven days, he said, and, and it's marked by this festival, he said it's important that my people gather together intentionally to celebrate and worship together. Can I tell you, there's something that takes place in a room like this when you're gathered in it that you're not going to ever get watching a TV screen or listening to the radio. Listen, I'm not saying those things are bad because there's some wonderful stuff. We're, we're making materials available to you every day to, to enhance and add value to your life. But it is never a replacement for what takes place corporately in a place like this every week. This is vitally important for our spiritual health. And he said, no work of any kind may be done on these days except, I love the fact he put this in there, except in the preparation of the food. I was like, woo, I like that. He said, every seven days, you've got to realize in, in just a short period of time, they're going to be delivered. They're going to go out into the desert. Moses is going to be called up on Mount Sinai. God's going to give him the Ten Commandments. He's going to give him civil law, moral law, all these things, including the observance of, of the Sabbath day or the seventh day as a day of rest, worship, and reflection. And here he's going to institute. He puts it in the celebration before it ever takes place. That's how important it is. To God, we're almost done. Verse 17. He says, Celebrate this festival of unleavened bread, for it will what? There it is again. It will remind you that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very Day. I went back and looked at this word forces because I, I was like, that sounds like an army, a troop, trained people. And that's exactly what the word means. He said, I want you to be reminded that on this day I brought your forces, your army, your troops, those who are battle 
ready. Listen, they have been slaves and are in bondage to a group of people that they can't get out of their own situation. And yet God said, this is the day that all of a sudden, those of you who thought you had no future, that you had limits placed on you, you are going to recognize that there is something in you that you didn't even know you had when God brings the answer. Hmm. See, as you go through your season of crisis and pain and suffering and the thing that has lasted so long and has broken you in your spirit and in your emotions and your heart, God says, I've seen that all along. I, I, I know what's going on. I've heard your cry. I have not forgotten you. But what God's asking of us today is, he says, I want you to go ahead and worship me and celebrate me even though you haven't seen the answer to that problem or situation come. And he says, oh, and by the way, when I decide to deliver you and bring you out, he said, you're going to discover some things about you that you had in you you didn't even know you had. But listen, your problem and your struggle is making you a stronger and a better person than you ever thought you could or would be. There's not a person I dare say in here, including me, I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand on your behalf, that says, you know what, Lord, I want to be a better, stronger person. I, I want you to develop the gifts, talents, and abilities in me. I want you to bring out of me things I didn't even know were in me. And if you need to break me and put me in a season of pain and struggle and anguish or even an extended period of that, then go ahead. I want you to sign me up. I don't think any of us are going to raise our hand to sign up for that all because that's not our nature. But here's what I do know. It's been when God has delivered me from those extended seasons of pain and famine and drought and anguish and when he has miraculously delivered me that all of a sudden what I thought or didn't even know existed in me, he always brought something new out of me. I want you for just a moment to try to get in your mind, conceptualize what he's saying to them right here to a group of people who generationally have been in slavery over 430 years. They thought that was always going to be their future and now they're about to leave. And God said, I want you to worship and celebrate me even before you see the answer come. And by the way, as soon as I deliver you, I'm going to develop some character and strength in you that you didn't even know you had. And let me tell you why this is so important and why I think he noted it in this passage. Because immediately when the plague comes and Pharaoh and the, all of the Egyptians are crying and mourning, they say, we've got to get rid of them, and they, they thrust them out rapidly. They went out into the wilderness, and then Pharaoh changes his mind. He pursues them. You know the story. And we have the, the Red Sea crossing, that miraculous deliverance recorded. Then Moses spends an entire chapter 15 singing praise and worship to God after that victory. Then the very next chapter we see him bringing the bread from heaven, the manna that fed them for 40 years. And Moses obeying God at this occasion and water coming out of the rock to provide for that entire nation. It is, it is in rapid succession their deliverance in the wilderness, the Red Sea crossing, the manna, water from the rock. And the next event that you read in the scripture is they come under attack by the Amalekites. And God said, even before they got delivered, he said, this is your identity today, but tomorrow some of you are going to be warriors because you're going to need to defend the people around you. See, God already knows what you need to look like when you come out. He already knows what you need to look like when you come out of your Egypt so that you can be a deliverer for other people. I feel this so strong. I never 
get to stand on a stage and share the word of God if I hadn't been in a season of Egypt in my past. Because God developed a character in me that I never knew was in me. Because he said, I'm going I'm to allow you to help some other people. And I'm asking you this day by the power of the Holy Spirit to think of your worst circumstance, your worst season of life. It may have been recent. You may be in the middle of it. You may have just entered it. And I want you to understand that worship to God is so critical in that season. And I want you to be encouraged to know that God hears your prayer and when he speaks to you, it's time for you to obey. Not later, but right then. And when he brings you through and delivers you out, your identity is going to be different than what you ever thought possible in your life. To serve your God and to serve other people he said make this a permanent festival a permanent remembrance for generations to come what parts of your story have you never told see God has been good to all of us He's worked miracles on all of our behalf. What stories have you never taken time to tell somebody? How can we say we love the God who brought about the deliverance when we've not even taken time to share our story? Do we not understand the glory and the honor that it brings Him? When we say, this, is, this used to be my life, this is what held me captive. This is what subdued me. This is where I was broken. This is where I went astray. But God, <laughs> but God delivered me. And he's equipped me and changed my identity. And I know if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Heads bowed. The spirit of prayer right now across this room. How many of you would be honest and, and like me, you say, you know what, I've been guilty. I've been waiting for all the answers. I've been waiting for everything to work out in my life before I give him praise and glory and honor. And I realize today that perhaps the most critical thing I can do is learn to worship him and celebrate him. Even while I'm still in my Egypt and with God's help, I want to be intentional about worshiping him, even if my circumstance hasn't changed. If that's you, just slip your hand up right now. We're getting ready to pray. I believe God sees your heart. I know he does. Yes. Thank you for being honest all over this house this morning. How many of you also be honest enough to say, you know what, I recognize through this message that perhaps I've had the blood applied on the exterior of my life. I've made a profession of faith, but I need to take a more diligent approach and I need to consume the sacrifice. I need to, to become who and what he is by daily taking in through his word, through prayer, through fellowship with other believers. I don't want to be content with just having the blood applied on the outside of my house or the, my life, as it were. But I want to be intentional about consuming Jesus so I become more like him. And you won't help with that. Just slip your hand up right now. God sees your heart, and he's going to help you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Thank you. There's somebody that 
you have heard this word today and something has been stirred inside of you and maybe for the first time ever or in a long time you recognize that there is hope on your horizon and you have expectancy right now that you didn't have when you come in this place and you're looking for deliverance from your Egypt miraculously and you're expecting that and you want God to develop a new character in you and change your identity slip your hand up right now God yes 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 One last question. How many of you will, like me, and I've, I've raised my hand, I've got it up right now, you're not looking, but I've got it up right now so you're not alone. We'll be honest and say, you know what, I've done a really poor job of telling my story and sharing it with people. And I realize I'm to remember what God's done for me. I'm I'm to help other people by sharing that at the appropriate time and place. And with God's help, I want to do a better job of that starting today. If that's you, raise your hand. I've got mine up already. Thank you. This whole house, it looks like. Thank you. Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the truth and the power and the anointing of your word that has the ability to speak to every individual that hears this message. Thank you for reminding us that even as your people, as the Israelites were your chosen people, we are not exempted from pain and struggle and sorrow in our life. And oftentimes we end up in places and seasons that hold us captive and in slavery and bondage, as it were, where we have no peace of mind. It impacts our relationships, perhaps even our health. And I thank you that today you have reminded us that when we call out to you, you hear us, you see us, you know where we are, you have not forsaken us. But what we have really understood through this passage today, it is critical that we listen to your voice, that we obey you, and that we worship and celebrate you even before we see the answer to the prayer that we've been praying for so long. Lord, and many in this place have acknowledged that with your help, they're going to do that. And I pray that you would remind us daily that we'll be intentional about worshiping you and giving thanks even before we see the answer come to pass. Lord, for those of us who've acknowledged that we need to move beyond just having the external signs of faith and religion, as it were, on the outside of our lives. It is necessary and important and good, but we need to be consuming your truth. Lord, as we go through your word this year together as a congregation and we consume the word of God, make it alive and real to all of us. Give us a hunger and a thirst for it that cannot be quenched, that we consume it every day. And in doing so, we'll be transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, for those whose hearts have been touched today by this message that brings hope and encouragement, they've begun to understand perhaps for the first time that despite their past or current circumstance and situation, as they move forward and worship you, And walk in obedience that your deliverance is close at hand. And that when it happens, it will happen suddenly and rapidly. And they need to make preparations even now to move forward in faith as you bring about the answer to the thing that has held them captive so long. Thank you for that blessed hope. And peace. And Lord, for all of us who acknowledge that we do a poor job of sharing our story with others, 
Some may have been events that happened last week, last year, 10 years, 40 years ago. But they were monumental, life-changing events. Lord, may we be intentional about sharing those things with our children, our grandchildren, with our friends, our family, co-workers, our brothers and sisters in Christ as you open the door of opportunity, as you lead us in that direction. Because much of what happens in our future will be determined on how we remember and celebrate you for our past. What a powerful message that you have reminded us of here today. For all that you have done, are doing, and will continue to do long after this service has concluded in this building, we give you praise and glory and honor for us in Jesus name we pray amen